are you a Magic the Gathering player who is looking to either get into Oathbreaker or advance your Oathbreaker skills? This is the place for you. It is not gameplay, it is not deck tech, this is card evaluation. I am super into Oathbreaker and I'm going to evaluate cards and how they will have a good effect for your decks if you so choose to use them, but if you don't want to use them, that's perfectly fine. You, you play whatever cards you want, this is a casual format, it's supposed to be fun, and but if you like to kick butt and blow away everybody else with the power of your deck because that's you, then this video might be more for you, but also this is some budget restriction because I'm only doing commons from Modern Horizons. This is a video series talking about what cards are good from sets and I'm focusing on common because nobody wants to break the bank getting expensive cards to upgrade decks in a casual format. So here you can spend pennies and get really strong cards that will definitely, most likely, if played right, blow your enemies away in Oathbreaker. And we are starting right now. tokens. If your opponent has lots of tokens, then they might just mow down your planeswalker easily because you yourself don't have enough to block them. These are questions that I raise and I answer them. How you can protect your walkers, how you can defeat your opponents, and continue on your own strategies. So a little bit deeper into this video specifically, Mon Horizons just recently came out. I got myself a box of it and I decided to look over some of the best commons from each of the color groups. I narrowed it down to four cards from each of the five color groups that I really thought they could have a good impact in Oathbreaker, but then I was like, 20 cards is going to be a lot to talk about, so I narrowed it down to 10. I kept two cards in each color. They're all commons. If you guys enjoy this video, at the end of it, found it helpful, then maybe I can do ones on uncommons and rares. My first pick from the white color wheel... <laughs> My first pick from white is a regular cohort. Two, a white, and a white for a 2-2 shapeshifter creature with changeling. And when it enters the battlefield, create a 2-2 colorless shapeshifter creature token with changeling. And why did I pick this? Well, in white, there is a lot of knight creature synergies. Think like uh, <laughs> the one saga from... Dominaria, which gives all your knights plus two plus one. This works with that guy. And tokens are a lot better in Oathbreaker than, say, Commander, which is what I was like, hey, what kind of impact will this have on Oathbreaker that is better than Commander, that it would not go in a Commander top 10 list, but it would work in Oathbreaker top 10 list. Let's say this comes out on turn four, so it's not super early. But it does give you two bodies, they're both bears, but if you have tribal synergies, that's really good. The main reason I chose this was because it was two bodies tacked onto one, and white weenies like that, and the changeling ability makes it good for creature type decks. My other white pick for the best Oathbreaker cards was Stirring Address. One and a white for an instant that reads, Tart creature you control gets plus two plus two until end of turn. We're not necessarily that good, it is a combat trick, and if you have a bunch of little flyers or something and they get over your opponent's creatures, then you could instant response do this. Maybe if it was only two extra damage, need to take out their planeswalker and put a stop to whatever strategy they have, and this might come in handy, but that's not really what we're going to be doing with it. You see, it has overload for five and a white, and what that does is it changes each instance to each. So each of your creatures gets plus two plus two. And yes, it does cost six. So six, turn six is about where it transitions from the mid game into the late game, where people will now start claiming victory in Oathbreaker if you're playing very competitively. But if you're not, if your playgroup is not the most competitive, then it might be a little bit longer. Turn seven, eight, nine, maybe. But now, Stirring Address, if you've created a lot of tokens already, you can play this and now all of them, maybe like there's like five of them, they're all three threes or four fours, and you march across all of your opponents, and maybe victory is yours by then, who knows? <laughs> 
Moving on to blue, the first one that I chose was Choking Tethers. Three and a blue for an instant, tap up the four target creature. It also has cycling for one and a blue, and when you cycle it, you can tap target creature, which I think is pretty decent. You pay to draw a card and tap down a creature if you're just cycling it. And there'll be a lot more creatures, which is why I thought this will be beneficial. People will play lots of tokens, like Hordling Outburst, is that a card? Hordling Outburst creates three 1-1 one, one Gobbos, and that's like, they're gonna protect the, they're gonna, they're, if you have, there's a bunch of tokens, your opponents have a bunch of tokens, then you're like, uh-oh, I don't have enough creatures, they're gonna get in and deal damage to my Planeswalker, then I won't be able to minus or ultimate and maybe get rid of it and I won't be able to be like in the game in the game and so you want to have lots of creatures and if your opponents they will be thinking the same thing they're like I got to get creatures out to protect my walker if I want my strategy to go as planned if I want to be able to use my signature spell and this will suppress their creatures so your creatures can come over and just take take them out ruin their strategies and if it's not looking that big, tap up the four target creatures, you can tap creatures from each of your opponents. So you, then you can go after everybody rather than just one person. And that is <laughs> pretty scary. If I just created a little token army, if I have four, four, four knights on the battlefield and somebody does this, and boom, I get trampled. Goodbye. The next blue card I chose was Phantasmal Form. Two and a blue for an instant until end of turn. Up to two chart creatures each have base power and toughness 3-3. Three, three, and they get flying and become illusions. And then you draw a card. I really like the fact that it replaces itself and you can play on turn 3. And I've, <laughs> I keep bringing this up. There's tokens. Tokens everywhere. If you could pay 3 and you beef two of your tokens up a lot and you give them flying evasion so they can fly over your opponent's creatures, maybe deal six damage to a player, a planeswalker, get rid of it, and that's, that's really good. And the card replaces itself, so that's like, even if the card didn't draw you a new card, I still think this is gonna be, would have been really good. That's just extra value, and it's a common. So you can afford it! Moving on to the black, I have Gluttonous Slug. One and a black for a zero three slug horror with menace. So with some evasion, which makes it hard to block. But other than that, it has evolve. Whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, if it has greater toughness or power than this creature, put a plus one plus one counter on Gluttonous Slug. Did I say Gluttonous? Glutonous. You, what you're gonna want to do is that you have to you have this out turn two It's gonna protect your walker not from evasive creatures But if you play more creatures and get this guy pumped up then you swing in with him He has menace so he can't be blocked and even if they did his toughness is much higher than his power <laughs> So you take out some of your opponent's creatures You don't lose him most likely because he's a toughie and evolve is a little bit limitless. Of course, you'd need stronger and stronger creatures, but the plus side is it might also be the most powerful creature on your side of the board. That's questionable, but it does have menace, so it's not like, okay, even if your opponent were to block it, they would have to spend two people, which means one of your other people, they can't get blocked. But since it is a little bit weaker and because the evolve it's most likely going to be a 1-4 most of the time, maybe a 2-6, and they're just going to let it go through, rather than if you have a bunch of other stuff. If you have, like, army tokens, there's a the thing, that recent... It's just kind of a handful, which is why I think it will be really good in Oathbreaker decks. And this has no place in EDH. I really doubt this has a place in Popper and Modern, of course not. Standard? This isn't even in standard, so I think Oathbreaker is the best home for it. And next is for one black, Unearth. It's a sorcery. Return target creature card with converted mana cost three or less from your graveyard to the battlefield and has cycling pay two. So let's say you lose your Glutona Slug, you pay one and it comes back. Completely free of charge. It cuts out mana cost. Yes, it's sorcery speed, not instant speed, so you can't like cut around it, 
But what if you put this as like your signature spell? Then pretty much any time you could bring back one of your little guys. And this black graveyard stuff, people want creatures to die and then enter. I think this would be good if you had like an aristocrat's oathbreaker strategy. Not that I know of any, but I think this card has lots of potential because it cuts mana cost. It only costs one black, so you get this early game. You can't really do anything with it. But in the late game, you could be like, oh yeah, I cast this guy, bring back <laughs> a harpy, bye bye it's a 1-1 one -one flyer. Let's just take, take out the opponent, bye bye Now on to the red of the pie color ink. I chose Bogardian Dragonheart for two and a red. This human shaman creature is a 2-2, two -two, but sacrifice another creature until end of turn, Bogardian Dragonheart becomes a dragon with base power and toughness 4-4, four -four with flying and haste. So you pay three, summon this dude, sacrifice, I don't know, a goblin token because you're in red. Then it becomes a 4-4 four, four flying hasty and just smash an opponent. They weren't expecting that on turn three, I'm pretty sure. And if they did have their walker out, it'd be gone. Or if you are being attacked, then you could sacrifice a creature in response to blocking your opponent, make this guy big, eat the other creature. But they would probably see that coming, so you couldn't do that. But even still, you could just repeatedly attack with this guy if you sacrifice a creature. Aristocrats, red black. Number two in the red is Goblin War Party. And I should mention, it's not like ranked in these orders. I just chose two. It's not like one's better than the other. If you want to decide which one's better than the other, be my guest. Choose one, create three one one red goblin creature tokens or creatures you control get plus one, plus one, and haste until end of turn. It also has entwine for two and a red, so if you really wanted, you could pay seven, create three goblins, give them plus one, plus one, and haste, seven, suddenly you have six power dispersed across three creatures, which is pretty menacing overrunning the opponent's board, but as for the late game in Oathbreaker, if you're doing casual, this will freak everybody out. You might take out somebody's walker and their strategy. But I would say mid-game, you use this to create three 1-1 one -one goblins, then you're kind of, you're protected. And if it's late game, then you can just cast it for all creatures you control, get plus one, plus one in haste, and then swing in with a bunch of boys. But, and again, paying four for that is kind of expensive, so you'll want <laughs> a whole army of creatures which might be hard to do in red in Oathbreaker with the shorter turns. But, yeah, I selected it for the first ability because it creates the goblins. And it's like Hordling Outburst, pay one red red, create the dudes. But this costs only one red and three, so you can mix this up in other decks. It's not so heavy on the red. Now on to the last, but not the least color, because it's green. We got Mother Bear. One and a green for a 2-2, two -two, this literal bear. Yeah, okay, it'll protect you, it might threaten your opponents, but when it dies and you go to the mid game or the late game, you can pay three a green and a green, exile her from your library, and get two 2-2 two -two bear tokens, which I think is really good because if you think about it, you're kind of paying seven for three 2-2 two -two bodies. And I think that's good because tokens are good in Oathbreaker. They protect your walker, they threaten your opponents, I always say this. So that's exactly why I think it's going to be good, because you can use it later in the game when it's already died to create two new tokens, two new creatures, and the second green card has a lot in common because it's Twin Silk Spider. For two and a green, you get a 1-2 reach spider creature. Then when it turns the battlefield, create a 1-2 green spider creature token with reach. And this will be summoned in like the mid game or maybe the late game, if this is just a draw. And if it is, you can summon it to create protection for your walker, and it protects flying guys, so that's that's a really big plus. I don't know if I would choose this if it didn't have reach, because a lot of flyers are 1-1, one, one, but if your opponent playing white has like Pegasuses, Pegasuses or something, then maybe you can have them both together block the Pegasus, get rid of the Pegasus, and keep one of your spiders, but its ability to protect your walker <laughs> for three, I think it's worth it's worth it to me. So I believe that this is a really good popper card, not popper card, but 
a really good common card for Oathbreaker. And that are all my common picks that you don't have to pay a lot of money to get that will help your Oathbreaker decks, I firmly believe. And let me know if you choose to do these or not. I'm pretty sure I'm going to put the spider and the bear inside my Garrick Wildspeaker Oathbreaker deck because he loves creatures. You know, Garrick Wildspeaker, you ult him. They all get plus three, plus three, and trample until end of turn. And all these creatures are really good for that. And there's just a small idea if you're going to do that too. And I guess maybe I should get you some examples for the other things. Uh, choking Tethers, if you have uh, the, the Sahili, the one from War of the Spark, which duplicates creatures, uh, I like to do that and cast like Nahiri Stone Blades on two things, so then they get pumped up and double them. More power. It's like kind of a combo defeat for not necessarily like ending the game, but since it's usually me and my little brother, that's what I like to do because it wins 80% of the time. Yeah. That was a really bad example, I'm sorry. But, now, thank you for watching. If you found this helpful, let, let me know if you want me to do like an uncommon or rare version. Thank you so much for watching and have a wonderful day. Good luck. I hope you win your next game using one of these cards. I want your spiders <laughs> to be the source of your victory and your changeling. Goodbye.